John Sawat made an interesting observation one time. He noted that all beings are looking for happiness. All beings want happiness. And as he said, what that shows is that we don't have it. We're suffering. Otherwise, what good would happiness be? Why would we need it? As he said, we're born into suffering. If you survive birth, you don't just lie there happily. You cry. You squirm around. You can look at the rest of your life as a lot of squirming. There's this basic sense of discontent that we all have. And what the Buddha does with his teachings is try to tame that discontent, to civilize it. Think of the teachings called the Customs of the Noble Ones. they are four altogether. The first three say you have to be content with what you've got in terms of food, clothing, and shelter. You focus your discontent someplace else. That's what the fourth custom is. You want to learn how to delight in developing and to delight in abandoning. And the reason you develop and abandon is because you realize that you can't stay content with what you've got in the mind. There are things you've got to develop and things you've got to abandon. And if you're going to do it well, you have to delight in it. This principle also comes down to heedfulness. That just because you want to escape some, from something, you can't just run away. If you're going to do your escape, you have to plan it well. It's like those movies where they have a very well-planned prison break. The people trying to get out of the prison, if you just rush at the guards, they'll shoot you. That, that's the end of that. You have to figure out very carefully how it's done, and you have to take a pleasure in working out all the details and doing it right. That's how heedfulness trains your discontent. We want to let go. We want to go all the way to awakening. We want that happiness. We have to follow the steps. Think of the Buddha's image of the cow. It's in a pasture. It's got nice grass and it's got nice water in the pasture. And it looks over to the other side of the hill across a ravine, and there's another pasture. And it wonders, what's the grass like over there? What's the water like over there? But because the cow is foolish and inexperienced, it doesn't know how to go down into the ravine and get back up. And as a result, it loses the grass and water that it had to begin with. Now, in the Buddha's example here, it's an image for people who are beginning to gain some concentration, and they want to move on. What you have to learn how to do is tame your discontent. Realize if you're going to do a good job, if you really want to get out of the suffering, you have to follow the steps. The part of the mind that's really in a hurry, that's really impatient, that has to be tamed. We think of the mind taming the heart. You know, the mind understands things and just can't get the heart to go along. But the heart sometimes goes along too well. It's in too much of a hurry. It hears about all these wonderful things and says, yeah, I really like that. I'm going to go right now. And then when it can't get there right now, then it gets disillusioned, gets upset, and loses its interest. You've got to train the heart so that it's ready for these things. That's why I have the practice of generosity, why you have the practice of virtue. You're training basic habits that you're going to need as a meditator. And you want a good foundation. But it's not the case that you, in those cases that you have to wait till your foundation is good before you start meditating. You develop your generosity and your virtue as you meditate. But you have to realize that this is going to require work. 
one of the reasons the Buddha sets out steps in the path is he takes a really big job and he breaks it down into little pieces. So you can content yourself for the time being with this piece. And then when you've mastered that, then you remind yourself, okay, you can't rest here. There's another piece. That's what heedfulness tells you. You can't rest there. There are some good things along the path. You get the mind into concentration. There's a sense of well-being, even a sense of a rapture. But you realize that's not good enough. Your heedfulness and your discontent keep pushing at you, but you have to say, well, I've got to just do the next step, and then the next step. So while you're here, what is the next step? Well, basically you stay with the breath, and you adjust the breath to the point where it's good enough to settle down. We're not here to create the perfect breath. We're here to get the breath good enough so the mind would be willing to settle down in the body. Because if you don't adjust things with the breath, the body's not a very comfortable place to stay. It has its aches and pains here and there. But as you breathe comfortably, breathe around the pains, breathe through them, allow the bands of tension to dissolve away, it gets to the point where it is good enough to stay. And then you allow it to stay. Try to keep your gaze as steady as possible. And energy will come up. The Buddha's image of, of a spring in a lake. It keeps flowing and flowing and flowing, and the rain keeps coming in so the spring doesn't dry up. And it's satisfying for a while, and sometimes though it gets to be too much. That's where you think of the energy flowing out the hands, flowing out the feet, flowing down the tailbone, out down into the ground, flowing out your eyes. Or think of adjusting your focus. So instead of focusing on the gross energies in the body, you focus on the more subtle ones that are right there in the same place. Try to erase any perception you have of the skin of the body holding things in. Remember, the skin is full of pores. The atoms of the skin are largely space. Hold that perception in mind. And that excess energy can diffuse. It has nothing to push against. There's an even more subtle level of well-being. And you stay there long enough, everything in the body seems so well connected, the breath energy gets so that it can feed itself. In other words, if there's a sense, sense of a lack of energy in some part of the body, the energy in another part will go right there. You get to the point where you don't even need to breathe in and out. This is what the Buddha means by the stilling of bodily fabrication. The mind gets really, really still and very content. The body is still. That's when you can see events in the mind clearly, because that's what we're here for, is to see the movements of the mind. And John Fuhrman would have you experiment first with thinking about the different elements in the body. There's earth, water, wind, fire. You start first with the breath. The breath is all smoothed out now, so you think about fire, the warmth. Notice where there's warmth in the body, which spots seem to be warmer than others. And then you focus there and allow that sense of warmth to spread out and fill the body. If it gets excessive, then you think of coolness, the water. And where's the coolest spot in the body? You focus on that. And then let that spread out. Then you think of the solidity. The whole body is solid. Then you try to think of mixing these so everything feels right. In other words, not too cold, not too hot, not too light with the breath, not too heavy with the solidity. Got it just right. What you've done is learned about the power of perception. Then you've learned how to control your perception so that when you go to the perception of space, say, 
Think of the space filling the areas between all the atoms in the body and going out beyond the skin. Your ability to hold on to that perception is a lot more solid. And then you can ask yourself what it is that knows the space. You've got the awareness. You're just your sense of awareness sitting right here. In other words, you learn how to take things apart bit by bit by bit. As the mind settles down like this, you're peeling away this layer, peeling away that layer. And it's in the peeling away that you see the movements of the mind, how the mind puts things together. And that's when both the mind and the heart are ready to start letting some of these things go. You've been letting go of certain things just to get the mind in concentration. But now you can see things a lot more clearly, because you've established a good foundation, and you've sensitized yourself to what's going on, stilled everything down. It's like trying to find a mouse in a wall. Say they're scratching the wall, but if you've got the generator going, and if you've got your TV going, and you've got your stereo going, and you've got your refrigerator going, you're not going to hear the scratchings in the wall. You've got to turn off all these machines, make less and less and less noise. And then you can start picking out the little sounds that you wouldn't have heard otherwise. And as your sensitivity gets more refined, you begin to see even little subtle things in the mind. They have their harm. We started out with blatant suffering. We learned how to work our way through that. So we see even subtle things and realize, okay, this too is stressful. You're raising your standards for what counts as well-being. And this is how the mind gets ready to start peeling things away even more radically. It's because you've trained both the heart and the mind very patiently and gone through the steps. Again, it's like that prison break. They do their steps very carefully. You have to be subtle so they can't be detected. It's like watching one of those old Mission Impossible films. TV show. I saw it as a TV show. Well, they have something impossible. It seems impossible, but bit by bit by bit, very delicately, very carefully, they can do it. So the mission impossible turns into a mission possible, a mission done. And if they just rushed at the evil person, the evil person would kill them, that would be that. They have to do everything very subtly and very skillfully. Well, that's what we're doing as we get the mind to settle down. We're learning about the subtleties of the mind by developing our skills. And this is what it means to delight in developing. You take delight in the subtleties. You take delight in doing things well, almost to the point where you forget why you're here. That discontent that's eating away at the mind. But fortunately, your heedfulness reminds you. And even though things get really comfortable as you're settled in, we're not meant to stay there. The Buddha said there's something that's heartwood. His image is of going through a tree and not contenting yourself with the leaves or the bark or the soft part of the wood. You want the heartwood, something that really is worth, worthy of your contentment. In other words, once you've got it, you don't need anything more. That's what it means to be really content. We can't clone contentment by saying, well, just be okay with whatever. That aborts the path right there. But at the same time, we can't let our discontent run wild. We have to tame it. We have to civilize it. As you follow the steps, and bit by bit by bit, you get out of the prison. But 
learning how to take delight in being really subtle in how you understand your mind, how you deal with your mind. As John Fuhrman once said, if we could st storm nirvana or take nirvana by storm, everyone would have gone there a long time ago. It's because it's delicate work. So we haven't gotten there yet, but so learn how to take some delight in the delicate work. This is why the Buddha taught so much about the path in detail. He didn't teach about nirvana that much in detail. He said, do the path. The path will get you there, and that's what counts. <laughs>